Hello again. Thanks for your company. You are watching Australia's best online football show. What a week it's been here and abroad. Manchester United fans bidding an emotional farewell to the great Sir Alex Ferguson and Roberto Mancini. What about him? He's now jobless after Manchester City lost at the hands of Wigan in the FA Cup final. Well, plenty of action here, as I said, coming up on this week's show. Keep an eye out for a full wrap on the State League highlights. We go one-on-one -on -one with the FFA's technical director, Han Berger, and ask him about the Socceroos' chances of qualifying for Brazil. And we pay tribute to our very own Katie Gill, glory for her on being named co-captain for the Matildas. But first, Alex Viteski continues WA's proud history of producing fine goalkeepers. At the age of 24, he's played for two nations, played for the Perth Glory and had a stint overseas. But now he's gone back to basics, playing for the club which launched his career to help the Sterling Lions win a championship in 2013. Of Macedonian background, so born in Carapa. Was there for about a good five, six years of my growing up, shall we say. Started playing soccer, football when I was six years old. But up there, everything's all chilled out, had fun kind of a lifestyle. So I really enjoyed my, uh, my football there. Moved over to Perth. Started off at Sterling Suns Badda. Obviously, the academy started going and started playing at, uh, at Kings, which was uh, under Sterling Lions, I think, for a while, they were called Kings, and then went to Sorrento, trained with Willie McNally, one of the best goalkeeper coaches I've worked in throughout my career so far. You know, he was a major part of my development. Difficult to break into the Sorrento first team, you know, Neil Young was a goalkeeper there at the time. Fortunately enough, Sterling said to me, look, we'd love to have you. Mickey Lyons was a coach at the time, and he stood by his philosophy of, if you're good enough, you're old enough. I managed to break into the Australian under-17 Joeys at the time, and then Perth Glory offered me a a two-year contract, I was at the AIS for, for six months before my time started at Glory. It was a very, very enjoyable experience. It's the most professional full-time place on offer in the country, so it was something that definitely helped my development. Fortunate enough to, to play at Glory, went overseas to a club called FK Pobeda, Macedonian club. Uh, spent two seasons there. Was lucky enough to get called up for the Macedonian under-21s. Played in a couple of qualifiers against Greece and Croatia. Also lucky enough to get called into a camp with a senior team. Didn't get any caps, unfortunately, but, you know, trained with some players that Goran Pandev, off, yeah, just to name one, you know, played into Milan at the time and he uh, won a European championship. Why not stick around with the glory? Why look at other prospects? If you want to be a number one, you've got to train like a number two. And at the time, I was a number two and I trained as hard as I could. An opportunity arose for me to go to Asia to play and I played in the course of two seasons, 60 games plus, so I've really better for the opportunity. Tell us a bit about the club, but it wasn't all sweet and romance, was it? I was at a club called Procedure Jakarta, where I was fortunate enough to play in front of 40, 50,000. The atmosphere was something that you just can't describe. You can't hear yourself think, let alone talk to your teammates on the pitch. Three months after I'd signed, but stopped paying wages, so I got to a stage where I was maybe four or five months without any form of income, so got to a stage where I was in no no position to really stay there and continue on my time. When I first got the opportunity to come back to Australia, I thought what a better place to come to than Sterling. The people at the club are fantastic. They're the same people that gave me my opportunity when I was 15. You are joined by some former Glory colleagues in Dean Evans and Scotty Bullock. Scotty Bullock's been one of the best players in the, in the league over in Perth for, for many years. He's our creative spark that we look for when, we, when we're going forward. And also Dino, what you see is what you get. He'll never give you anything less than his best. It's something good for the club and hopefully, you know, it can push us in good, good stead for the future. The prospect of playing for the glory again one day or an international club, are you still welcoming that kind of prospect? The door's always open for, for me to go play overseas or if something in the A-League opened up again, I'll definitely look into it, you know. The, until the day I stop loving the game, that's when I'll, I'll stop wanting to do things, you know. I think uh, you'd be a crazy man not to take opportunities in football. It's the best job in the world, so why wouldn't you? 
Congratulations to Perth Glory women's star striker Kate Gill, who's been appointed co-captain of the Westfield Matildas. She'll share the role with Brisbane Raw's Claire Pokinghorn. The news comes on the back of a stunning return to form for Gill, who was hampered by a serious knee injury. She scored 11 goals for the Glory in the recent W League season. The striker has played 72 times for the Matildas and was named the 2010 AFC Women's Player of the Year. It's such a huge honour to be named co-captain of the Westfield Matildas. I think just to be held in that light, especially by your peers and obviously the coaching staff is just massive. Is there anything specifically that Hesterine has asked of you in terms of being a co-captain in this team? No, Hesterine hasn't said too much. I mean, she's given me such a, a great responsibility as well as Claire. So I think it's just about us playing football and being the people that we are. What's it like being a player under her leadership? Hesterine has very different leadership style to Tommy, of course. I mean, you can't really compare the two. They both have different philosophies and different strategies. So I think it's more of an adapting phase for the girls at the moment. I mean, it is being such a huge change, but I think a very welcomed one as well. Time for the Match of the Week highlights now. It's a double header. Inglewood hosts Coburn and Perth clash against Bunbury. It was a fresh look at Coburn City under the reins of new coach Mark Anthony against Inglewood United at Intega Stadium. The first half was even Stevens with both sides having a couple of decent chances to score. Coburn's best chance of the half, if not the game, came when Paul Lloyd's delightful chip was brilliantly saved by Inglewood keeper Luke Martino. The only other chance of the half fell to Inglewood after this deflected shot forced an amazing save from Coburn keeper Dejan Alexic who then had to put his body on the line. City dominated the second half but failed to threat in the final third. Coburn nearly stole the points at the death but Connor Kavanagh's shot flew just the wrong side of the upright. So, despite the drama, nil-nil it was. Both teams left to share the spoils. Always a hard game coming here. They're a good side. Uh, they're coming off a good result last week against Perth. And we obviously coming off a great result against Bayswater. So, I think if anybody was going to win it, I thought it would be us. Um, but like I say, they're, they're a dangerous side. Um, so, yeah, probably take a point. If the ball is not supplied by um, by your midfield, it's, it's it's nothing that you can do up front. It's evident that we, we're creating chances, but we're not scoring enough. That's as simple as that. It was nothing short of entertainment at Dorian Gardens between Perth and Bunbury. A four-goal first half sealed the final scoreline. Liam Boland got the Azuri off to the start they needed in the 19th minute. He then followed up with another 12 minutes later. Before they knew it, Bunbury were down a third thanks to Omoboye five minutes before half-time. But the South Westerners didn't give up. They fought hard to peg one back in stoppage time through captain Chris Blackburn. But 3-1 it stayed after 90 minutes. Three vital points for Perth's young outfit. More despair for Bunbury and new head coach Matt Holland. 3-1, you've got to give credit to Perth because they finished the three golden opportunities I thought we gave to them. And I've just had a chat with my lads about game understanding and knowledge and knowing the systems and different formations of the game to be able to do a different job when it's needed and unfortunately a lot of them didn't do that today but we'll knuckle down and they'll get through in the next couple of weeks and we'll move on. Three good points um, but still a long way to go. We, we keep, we keep uh, missing chances and uh, keep bringing the, the, our opponents in, into the game with mistakes so it's a long way to go. Are you still testing a few more players uh, as the season progresses? Are you happy with your squad at the moment? No, uh, I'm testing players. Um, I I agreed with the club that this year we'll um, we will test players. We don't hide the fact that we want to get into the, f the top five as well, if it's possible. But we still have limitations that um, that will keep us f far away from the top five or six teams at the moment. In other results, Sorrento suffered their first defeat of the season at the hands of Sterling. Armadale returned to winning ways with a 4-3 win over ECU. Joondalup were down 4-0 at half-time. Floriot registered their second league win in a row after disposing Balcatta in the dying minutes. And after a nervous start, Bayswater managed to edge out NTC. So, to the table, Bayswater, still after eight rounds, remain undefeated at the top. Sterling cemented their spot in second. Sorrento are three points behind. 
and Armadale and Balcato share the same points, round out fourth and fifth on goal difference. A top five place still in reach for anyone in the bottom half of the table. And to next week, Coburn host NTC. Can Floriot make it three in a row against Armadale? A Northern Suburbs derby looms between ECU and Sorrento. The Lions will be looking for three points against a young Perth. Bunbury will want to earn a point at home against United and old rivals clash when Bayswater host Balcata. Healthway and Football West have teamed up to find the Smarter Than Smoking Junior Player of the Month. Whether you're the star of your team or you just love to have fun with football, you can be in the running to win an Apple iPad. Each week I'll be asking a simple question and the answer will be revealed later in the show. Check out footballwest.com.au for details and tune in to our new Football 360 Junior Show to see if you've won our fantastic prize. This week's Smarter Than Smoking Junior Player of the Month question is What is the nutrient in milk that builds strong bones? To be in the running for an Apple iPad, check out footballwest.com.au and stay tuned to Football 360. Well, who can forget the hype and hysteria the Socceroos created when they qualified for Germany in 2006? But where do the Socceroos stand now in their quest for cup glory in Brazil come next year? Well, we caught up with the FFA's technical director, Han Berger, and asked him his thoughts about the Socceroos' current World Cup campaign. Like everyone else, uh, I was also disappointed about uh, the game in, against Oman. The simple fact uh, still is if we win uh, the, uh, the last two home games against uh, Jordan and Iraq, we will still uh, qualify for Brazil regardless of the result uh, of the, the first game that comes up is uh, Japan away. The so-called golden generation that uh, went to the World Cup in, in 2006 and 2010, those, those guys are getting of age. We don't have that quality and that depth in the current generation. And that's one of the reasons why we have rolled out initiatives uh, such as the national uh, curriculum and such as the, the NPL to create a better situation for the future. I'm very curious how our uh, young Socceroos will go uh, at the Under-20 World Cup in uh, June and July because that could be the a first signal and a first generation that uh, will help us uh, uh, get that depth and, uh, and that quality back in the future. What are your thoughts on the players who have come through the WA system in recent years? I think uh, WA can be very proud of, uh, of their NTC uh, programme. I think there's a good football culture in WA and they're producing a lot of good players and the work uh, Football West is doing, we are very uh, happy with that. One of the best advocates is Ellis and what he's doing with Perth Glory because you've already seen how things change there. The approach and the style of football and the young players that, uh, that he is uh, putting in. And basically what Alistair is doing is bringing into practice all the things that we have been advocating and, and been developing over the last couple of years and he's been part of that. He is simply showing that it's, it works in practice. Just before we go, a reminder about next week's Football Fan Forum at Dorian Gardens starting at 7pm the 20th of May where we'll have the A-League's Damien de Bowen, the FFA's David Gallup, Football West CEO Peter Hug and Perth Glory Chairman Tony Sage all on a panel discussing all things football, where we are and where we're headed. That's next Monday night the 20th of May at Dorian Gardens, kickoff at 7 o'clock. Well, that wraps it up for this week. Hope you enjoyed the show. We'll be back again next week. Thanks to Grill Up Croatia for their hospitality. They'll be featuring on Football 360 in a few weeks' time. But until next week, it's bye for now. Yeah.